Coming to the assembly hall at the uh, University of Illinois is a gentleman that I've admired for, for years and years and years and years and years and years. And I'm really making you sound old, aren't I? Yeah, don't make it too many years. <laughs> Bob Newhart is on the line. Good morning, Bob. Good morning. Pleasure to be talking with you. I think you're in Iowa now at the moment, aren't you? I'm in Michigan. Oh, in Michigan? Yeah. Well, you were in Iowa yesterday. Now I'll be in Iowa. Uh, oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, Lansing. Uh, and then uh, uh, Burlington, Ames, and then Champaign. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really love your work. I think the Bob Newhart Show is one of the greatest things that was ever on TV. Awesome. And I'm really sorry you got tired of it. Well, I, I got, that's not entirely the story. I got tired of it. Uh, I was a little concerned about what was going on television, the, the new shows that were being successful, and I didn't think our show kind of fit into the mold of, <clears throat> of the new trend, which was uh, Wonder Woman and... Um, Incredible Hulk and that kind of show, and so uh, uh, I thought we had done six years and we'd been successful. I thought maybe that was uh, time to say uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Time to to wrap it up while it was still a, a hit, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let me, let me talk to you a little, little bit about about your history, and I don't know what's going to happen tonight, but really, or not tonight, but on the weekend at the assembly hall, that's really the way you got started, wasn't it? Doing uh, stand-up material. I uh, doing yeah. Uh, I got started. Uh, nightclubs and then went into uh, college concerts and I, I played um, the university I guess oh at 64 or 65 um, exactly the assembly hall exactly the same place mm -hmm. and I always enjoyed them because I always found the audiences to be very responsive and uh, and intelligent and it's, it's it's kind of fun when you're working to an intelligent audience you know you were joking about talking in your, your best radio voice before we came on. You had never worked as a, as a radio announcer, had you? Well, a friend of mine, no, I never had. A friend of mine, uh, a disc jockey in Chicago, Dan Sorkin, uh, arranged for me to, uh, to audition. As a matter of fact, in Grand Rapids. And uh, I said, Dan, but I've never done it. He said, they won't know the difference. He said, I told them, you're, you're the top disc jockey in Texas, but you want to you get out of Texas. And, uh, they'll be very lucky to get you. you know? So I went over to audition, and, and they gave me some copy to read. And uh, they had the tape going, and, and I kept blowing lines, you know, and then I started laughing, cause, uh, and they weren't paying any attention to the tape, and I kept rapping on the window telling them to shut off the tape machine that, you know, obviously the jig was up. I had never, never been a disc jockey. So. Uh, I got back on the plane and flew back to Chicago, and that was the extent of my, of my radio experience. The interesting thing is I think your humor, uh, at least so much of it that I remember, is almost like radio and that it lets the audience use their imagination the uh, driving school instructor I grew up on radio you know it, that was uh, and it was a it was a, just a wonderful time it was uh, so many of the great mystery shows that were done I love a mystery and uh, and of course Jack Benny and uh, Fred Allen and uh, I guess I was kind of conditioned to that to that actually I started out another guy and I did a radio show uh, again unsuccessfully uh, uh, we were in three markets. We were in uh, uh, Idaho Falls, Idaho, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, Northampton, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. We had three three markets, and it was kind of a, a poor man's Bob and Ray kind of show. <laughs> and um, it was we, we lost money on it. it uh, we got a total of twenty two dollars and fifty cents a week uh, for syndicating it, and it cost us about forty dollars a week to to put it on tape and send it out. So at the end of 13 weeks, we said, look, we can't afford to do this anymore, uh, but we appreciate your playing our tapes. And then a friend of mine, uh, my partner, he had to move to New York, so I was kind of stuck. Either I had to do a stand-up or, uh, or find another, you know, somebody else to work with. So that I think in all the routines, there's there's somebody else there. There's I'm always talking to somebody, or, or uh, I'm still working as a double, even though my partner left. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking uh, Shelley Berman used to do that with the telephone business. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a, it's a great technique because I think it, uh, it lets the, uh, the audience really get in on your material, and they just really uh, eat it up, as it were. Well, you know, if you, at one time, uh, because you make records, and, of course, they were, at that time, they only knew from lyrics. They really didn't know from uh, comedy records. Uh, you had to type out the routine uh, to apply for the copyright, and... I happened to see a copy of, of, of one of the, uh, of the um, Abe Lincoln routine and realized that it wasn't funny at all. I mean, there, there was nothing that I was saying that was funny. It was, it was what was being unsaid by Abe on the other end of the phone. 
<laughs> when you see it staring at you on a blank piece of paper, you begin to say, wait, maybe I don't know if I should do this routine or not. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time to really develop the, the polish that really appears on one of the albums, I would think, that. Well, fun, uh, oddly enough, the, the good ones... Uh, the good ones seem to write themselves. They, they, when you really have a good idea, it just seems to it seems to flow. Mm -hmm. and when you have an idea that, that doesn't work, you can you can work on it for years, and, and you, it's like trying to make a, you know, a purse out of a sow's ear or whatever that saying is. Sure. Uh, that mixed metaphor I just tried. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and you go back to it and go back to it, and it never seems to work. The, the good routines seem to work the first time out. I, and sometimes it's hard to get that one single idea, I suppose. Well, that's, a, that's what you wake up every day hoping. You know, you keep saying, gee, I, you know, I pick up the paper and hope there's a, a something that will kick off uh, an idea. I, I read something the other day about uh, they found out Alexander the Great uh, was a drunk, you know, and uh, which explained a lot of his traveling. You know, he just kind of, <laughs> kind of reeled all through Mesopotamia. <laughs> and, uh, it occurred to me that maybe, uh, you know, some other drunks in history might have been Hannibal, you know, that the, he may have been roaring drunk when he got this idea of, of getting all the elephants. And Crossing the Alps? Crossing the Greeks by going over the Alps, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you come up with some funny concepts, and I don't mean to analyze humor here, because I always say whenever you start to do that, then it loses the funniness. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. You were an accountant, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I think, in fact, one of the liner notes on, on one of your albums, I think, said uh, that Sorkin wrote, said that you were able to make only seven and a half dollars or something after a hit record, which would indicate that you weren't all a good with, with numbers, maybe. No, I wasn't, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little more than that, but, uh, no, see, it, it's odd for an accountant to become a comedian, uh, but I wasn't a very good accountant. I mean, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't good at it at all, you know. I mean, I knew I, I, I had a degree in accounting, but I knew I would never uh, wind up practicing you know, as an accountant because I just I had no aptitude for it. You know. mm -hmm. But uh, comedy was another thing. Did Did Bob Newhart know that he could make people laugh at an early age? Well, I don't know. Y yes and no. I mean, I knew I made people laugh. Um, I I didn't really get into comedy because I, I would see things and I, I would just assume that everybody else saw them pretty much the way I saw them. And there's a little point in saying something to somebody, if, you know, they're just going to say, yeah, that's right, you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I tried a couple things and uh, they began to work and, and that encouraged me because, uh, I mean, no matter what you do, I, the comedy has to be the most rewarding, the most rewarding thing I, anybody can do. I mean, to, to, to get a routine and to work it out and make people laugh is just uh, mm -hmm. because in a sense what they're saying is hey I agree with you I know exactly what you're saying yeah. only you're getting laughter too they've, they've seen it we've all seen it before we've all seen driving instructor cars you know but uh, I guess I was the first one who explained what these poor souls actually went through in the, in the course of the day <laughs> mm -hmm. do you go through for, through a long period of time where I don't know, maybe it's the way your life is going, when things are particularly funny to you. And then maybe if you're not at an emotional high or something, you tend to overlook some of the same things the rest of us do. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, sort of. I, well, you have, um, you have dry spells, you know, and, and they, they scare the hell out of you sometimes, you know, and, and they can last, uh, oh, three, six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm never going to write anything funny again. And then, then you get an idea and you go with it and it, and it works. And, uh, and there's a tremendous satisfaction in it, mm -hmm. but it, it it scares you. And then there are those those folks that get some really good material, and they're they're kind of afraid to try anything new. I would think, because they know what they have really works. Yeah, you've got to. It, it takes a little bravery. You, you've got to. There's no other way of finding it out, you know, uh, mm -hmm. than by doing it. And, uh, but again, the satisfaction is is much higher you know, when it does work. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take too much of your time because I know you're a, you're a busy individual and it is a uh, thrill to talk to somebody that I've always admired over the years. Well, thank you, Ken. But uh, I don't know if you find certain audiences really work better than others. Do you find that the country, the climate that everybody's in right now is a pretty good time to make people laugh? It seems like we're almost going through the old days of, uh, I don't want to say the Depression era, but it seems like the country's in need of laughter now probably as much as it's ever been. That seems to be the case, you know, and... and Prosper times are not really good times for comedians. Uh, is bad times are when people want to get away from the world out there, and one way of getting away is, is, uh, is, is laughing, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
comedian serves a purpose of sorts. You know, if we if we can get people through that that terrible period, then uh, then you really feel like you've done something. Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess that's right. Uh, Sam Levinson, I interviewed him a number of times, and he put it very well, I think, if I can remember how he said it. He said that so much of the humor that people laugh at really just is there because it keeps you from crying about it, really. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. Bob Newhart, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Sat uh, Sunday night is the night at the uh, Assembly Hall in Champaign. I hope you have a great crowd because uh, I'm sure everybody's just going to have a terrific time. Well, thank you, Ken. Bob Newhart.